I'm Tony Northup and this is my free tutorial for the Panasonic GH5, our favorite, our favorite video camera. This is gonna be a long tutorial, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. Check the description down below and you'll see a table of contents so you can jump right to the parts that you wanna see. I suggest you grab your camera and actually work through some of the stuff because when you're actually filming something or shooting something, it's gonna be the muscle memory that makes it happen. Like your fingers kinda of need to learn it, so walk through it. If you have a different camera, visit sdp.io slash tutorial and you'll find cameras for just about every camera, tutorials for just about every camera out there. Send your friends there. Uh, first, I just wanna shout out to Panasonic because I, I read the manual to make this and make sure I don't miss a an important feature. Page 201, you will see a picture of me on the advanced user guide. That's, that's me right there playing, playing golf. It's a stock photo, like they clearly just bought it. I just I thought it was a funny little Easter egg that they hid in there to actually put me in the user manual. It's a weird experience to read a manual about a camera and see yourself in there. Chelsea took that picture. First, let's talk about the battery. We're gonna go over the bits and pieces of it. There's a little fl flippy door on the bottom here. You flip that out of the way, it flips open, and then this little lever here releases the battery. These are the same batteries as on the GH4. So if you had the pe previous generation of the camera as we did, you'll appreciate that you can continue to use those same old batteries. They're big batteries, they last a long time, but they do not last forever. And if the battery runs out during a shoot, you're screwed, right? <laughs> like we've had shoots ruined because of a battery and that's the dumbest feeling because you, you feel like, oh, I ruined a whole shoot, but I didn't spend, because I didn't spend 50 extra bucks on a battery. So definitely pick up an extra GH5 battery at, um, you'll see these stp.io links throughout the video. Those all send you to Amazon. That's our affiliate account. So we get a few pennies out of every dollar and we appreciate the support that you give us. You can also get third-party knockoff batteries, but we've had those die just randomly on us. We've tried like all the different brands and they just seem to randomly cut out. So we stick to the actual uh, name brand ones. The GH5 does not have USB charging, which is a pain because when we're traveling, we like to just use eUSB power for everything. So what we've done instead is get this little double USB charger that you can hook into a USB battery or your USB port on your car or whatever, and just charge batteries on the go. And it will charge two batteries at a time. And it's smaller and thinner than the battery charger that came with your GH. So you can pick it up at sdp.io slash GH5X2 from Amazon. Uh, if you're worried about battery power, you might also consider getting Panasonic's vertical grip, which will store an extra couple of batteries um, in it and just have you just shooting all day so you don't have to worry about them. That link will take you there. The lenses here are pretty straightforward. Of course, they'll snap on regular bayonet mount, just snap it on until it clicks, line up the red dots, and then wiggle it back and forth and make sure it's okay. You will notice some lenses will have the power OIS switch on them. Uh, you'll pretty much need to want to leave that on. I've never had any problems caused by the optical image stabilization on it. Let's move on to talking about the memory cards. Memory cards are your digital film. They're hidden behind this little door here. So pull that back and it flips open. GH5 now has two memory cards. <sighs> Thank goodness, because we've had shoots where we filmed everything and then the card was ruined and we tried things like photo rec and couldn't recover it. So it's really important that you record to two cards whenever possible. It supports UHS-2. You don't have to use UHS-2. UHS-2 cards are expensive and you don't need them to record 4K. Uh, I would, however, suggest putting loading two matching cards in. Larger cards are better than smaller cards. Let me show you how to actually configure it to write to two cards at a time. Turn the camera on with the big switch up there. Great place for the switch. To set up the dual slot function, hit the menu button here in the middle of the directional pad. Go to your wrench icon and then on page three of four, go down to double slot function. Select that and go to recording method and select this. Backup recording. Record same photo video to both cards in one shot. Now, video or stills is going to write it the same thing to both cards. So if a card fails, if a slot fails, you can keep on going. Talk about memory cards. Like I said, it supports very fast standard UHS-2 cards. Um, and you're only going to need that if you're shooting stills continuously, really. Uh, so if you plan to be using those 6K shots, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or if you're shooting sports, or if you've just found buffering to be a bit of a problem, grab a UHS-2 card. They're more expensive and you can't even get high capacity versions like 256 gigs and up. I've only found 128 gig versions. But you can grab them at our Amazon link here, scp.io slash UHS-2. Um, we use the X-Pro, the SanDisk Extreme Pro cards. We don't have an affiliation with them. 
they're just the cards that we like. Usually the 256 gig versions, because I'd rather have running out of space, grinds the whole shoot to a halt. So I'd rather have far too much capacity. Um, grab these at sdp.io slash xpro. If you run into a problem where a card won't write, this is just a common problem that people run into. There is a little, a little write protection thing here, just like old school floppy disks, if you remember those. I so wish manufacturers would just remove this from SD cards, but see how it has a little lock icon there? If this thing moves accidentally, sometimes it'll get brushed, uh, or if it breaks off, the card won't write. One nice thing about these SanDisk cards is we had one break, and we just, I just sent it in them, and they just sent me back a brand new replacement, so they have a good warranty on those things. Let's talk about the physical ports on the GH5. They are everywhere. Most of them are alongside the left side here. Up separate is the mic jack. I'm glad that they put that one separate. You can run in a standard mic here, or maybe a shotgun mic here, or lab mics, or whatever. I'll make a couple of suggestions later on. Right below that, you'll find the headphone jack for monitoring your sound. I suggest you use both of those if you're recording any kind of video. I see people using mics but no headphones, but you don't know if the wind is hitting it or if they're getting interference from your wireless labs. And then the big slot down here has a couple of different ports. That's an HDMI port, a full-size HDMI port. Thank you, Panasonic, so you can run it to an external recorder. Or sometimes people want you, they want you to like hook it up to your TV because they imagine you putting on a slideshow, but nobody does slideshows like that anymore. Just show people on your phone or the back of the camera. And then right below that, you have a USB-C port for fast file transfers and such. It doesn't charge through that, but you could use it to transfer files from your camera to your computer. I tend to use a memory card reader just because they tend to be, I don't know, it's easier than hooking up a USB cable. Before we start actually shooting, I want to show you a diopter because that's another common problem that people run into. When you're using the electronic viewfinder here, you'll put the camera to your eye and with the default settings, the camera will automatically switch over. Um, if stuff looks blurry or if it looks like you think your camera's not focusing, put it up to your eye and then turn the diopter here, which is this very hard to see little hidden dial here. See how it like clicks up and down? You hold it to your eye and look, don't look at, at the scene, but look at the numbers and writing at the bottom and top of the screen. Look at those things and turn that until they're nice and sharp. If you're an eyeglasses wearer, this allows you to take off your glasses and look through there and just suddenly have perfect vision. It's actually a really easy way to see around. That's also really nice at night to use that electronic viewfinder. If you pass the camera between multiple people, you might have to warn them. If you've changed it, like you're gonna put it up to your eye and not be able to see a thing because I'm blind, something like that. Let's actually take a picture. Throughout this video, I'm going to be switching between telling you how to take still photos and video photos, though most of my emphasis is going to be on video recording because that's how we tend to use the GH5. Nonetheless, it's a totally capable stills camera. So to take my first still, I'm going to put the mode dial here into P mode. That's program mode, just it's like auto mode, basically, where the camera just makes up its own settings. And taking a picture is pretty easy. Half press the shutter. Well, first I'll put this dial here into autofocus AFS. This should be what you're using most of the time. This changes your different focusing modes. I'll put that into AFS, push the shutter halfway and it snaps into focus. It beeps. I'll show you how to turn that off. And then I'll push the shutter all the way down and it keeps taking pictures depending on your mode. We'll talk about the different shutter modes in just a second. While you're reviewing this, you can change the information that's viewed on the screen. So right now there's it's showing my exposure compensation and a bunch of different settings up here. Hit the disp button, which is kind of recessed into the grip. Hit that a couple of times and you can switch between different viewing modes. So this one allows you to focus on the composition of the scene. Um, this one actually shows you the virtual horizon so you can see just how far off tilt you are. Especially important with video where it's a little, you're losing a lot of resolution if you crop in video. So I really like to use this if I'm on a tripod, push it again and the extra information will go away, but the virtual horizon is still there and push it again. And now you can just see your settings big and bold and actually go in and um, change them. So that's kind of what's nice about this is this is giving you a really quick way to go in and just adjust different settings with the touch screen. So you can hit it again and it will blank out and allow you to use just the, the viewfinder here this is great if you're shooting in a dark environment and you don't want to disturb anybody. Hit disp until that back screen goes black and now you're not casting off a bunch of extra light. And once again, hit it and it will take you back to the beginning of the whole viewfinder process. 
You can also manually switch between the back screen and the viewfinder here by pushing this button to the left of the viewfinder. You might want to do this if it gets, if it's picking up your camera strap, if it's constantly switching back and forth, that can be kind of annoying. You can just switch it manually. The touch screen here works really well. By default, you can just touch and it will focus on different parts of the screen for you. That's great because this articulating screen flips out and sometimes you'll be like holding it up over a crowd and that means you can just focus here and it will keep stuff in focus for you. If you'd rather have it actually take pictures for you, see this little panel over here on the left, this pops out. So if I push that, it kind of slides out from the side. And now this gives me the choice between touch to auto expose or touch to, to actually shutter, touch shutter. So now that I've selected that, I can touch the screen and it will take pictures. So nice. So again, over the crowd, now I can easily shoot over the crowd and uh, touch to take photos. And that's usually what I'll have it on. For the purpose of still photos, I also want to show you the depth of field preview. Depth of field preview shows you just how much is going to be in focus in the shot. So let me get this focus on the screen here. And as I do that, you can see the background is just completely blurry, right? There's stuff back there, but it's just super out of focus. Let me just raise my, I'm going to put the camera into aperture priority mode so I can control the aperture. And I'm going to set the aperture to really high value, f22. And so now you can see the screen's in focus, but the background is out of focus. It's in its normal mode, it's behaving like an SLR would. It's not showing you the depth of field that you would get at f22. It's showing you uh, the lowest possible value for that particular lens. That lets it gather the most light, that lets it focus the fastest, but it doesn't give you a realistic expectation for what you're going to see. If you want to see the depth of field you're actually going to get, you'll hit the depth of field preview button, which is right here to the right of the lens, close to the grip. So as I push that down, you can see I'm, I, I'm pushing it to uh, toggle it between different modes. So that's with it off if I push it once. You can see now it's saying aperture effect on. And now suddenly, this is still in focus in the foreground, but the background here is much more in focus. So I push it again. A couple more times it will turn off. Okay, just want to show you where the depth of field preview works. If you shoot stills, uh, it's really nice to have that, because if you ever use it on a DSLR, everything gets really, really dark. Let me go back to my standard settings. You can record video at any time, by hitting the big red record button up here. That's nice if you're a hybrid shooter, you're shooting stills in one of the stills modes and you just wanna grab a quick clip of whatever you've composed, it'll just start recording for you. Most of the time, if we're using this for video though, I'll change the mode over to the creative movie mode here because it has an old timey video camera. <laughs> and with that set, you can now record using the big shutter button here. I always do that. I don't think I've ever hit this button because it's such, it's just, it's like hard to reach. I don't know, I don't like the placement of it, but using the shutter button basically solves that problem for you. If you're ever recording video outside, I want to suggest this gadget. It's only 20 bucks. It's just a little screen that will Velcro over this screen here and allow you to see it even in bright environments. The other option, of course, is just to use, put your eye to the eyepiece, that works fine, and it doesn't require you to carry everything else, anything else. But having it over this is really helpful because you can flip it out to the side, it might be low to the ground or high up, and you can kind of tilt it and just see better. It's just one of those things that we have found helps us out. So now that we've found a photo, let's talk about how to review it. Flip the screen back around. The reviewing photos button is this green play button up here. I'll push that and it will bring up the last photo or video that I took. That's a lousy photo, but here we go. Now with the touch screen, I can zoom in like this to just make sure that eyes are in focus, that type thing, and then pan around with my fingers. That works really well. Uh, I can flip between pictures using the touch screen like that too, or I can use the front dial here to flip between them quickly without having to worry about the touch screen. The back dial here zooms in in case you just want to zoom right into the middle of the picture, or if I roll backwards, it will show me thumbnails. So that's a quick way to find the kind of the specific picture that you're looking for. Now it's showing me a calendar, so I can flip back to a specific day, but usually I'm just using these thumbnails here. While you're reviewing a picture, you can hit the disk button to change the information that it's showing about the picture. 
So as I hit it here, it's showing me a bunch of information about the settings, the camera settings, and the particular mode that it was in. I can push it again, and it will hide more of the information. And a, a quick shortcut, if I push this button over here on the left, it will prompt me to upload the picture by Wi-Fi. I'm going to cover Wi-Fi later. I just wanted to point out where that was so you can file it away. It's kind of useful. One trick you should know is deleting pictures. This FN4 button doubles as the delete button. So if there's a picture that sucks like that one, I can push that and it will prompt me to delete a single picture, many, or all of the pictures. So I'll delete single and select yes. I know I've read about the electronic viewfinders before, but you can also review your pictures in the viewfinder. So if it's dark, again, hold it up to your eye and review pictures that way, dark or bright, where you might not be able to see the screen. I like to be able to rate pictures. If you import your pictures into Lightroom, it's really nice. When you're in the field and you take a picture that you like, you can rate it five stars and then you import your pictures and you'll be able to sort your pictures by the number of stars and instantly find that picture that you were excited about in the field. If you're reviewing a picture and you want to rate it five stars, do this. Hit that menu button, go down to the playback menu over here, and then go down to rating. Select that, select single, and now you can hit, hit the set button, and now you can scroll over to the number of stars that you want to rate a particular picture. When you're in rating mode, you can go through and just rate multiple pictures. I wish it were a little easier to get here from the review pane, but that's how you do it. You can also review video, which I highly recommend when you're in the field. If you've just captured an important video, double check it. Make sure that it looks and sounds good. So we recorded a little clip earlier. Let's scroll back a little bit. Okay, here I am from the last video that we shot. With this video selected, I can just hit the play button here in the center. And it will actually play through the speakers. You can adjust the volume here. Can see we're getting ready. I'm going to hold this button down to fast forward some. Um, notice that we're using the touchscreen a lot. I use a pair of $5 touchscreen gloves when it's cold out, and that allows me to interact with the screen. stp.io slash touch will take you to Amazon where we have them. If you're thinking about shooting video, you have a lot of choices on this camera. You can shoot 1080p at a variety of different frame rates. You can shoot uh, 4K, which is much more detailed than 1080p. Uh, and you can even shoot at 4K 60p. I've covered, I have whole videos dedicated to whether the benefits of shooting in 4K. Visit sdp.io slash y4k for our YouTube video about that. Or if you're interested in the benefits of shooting 30p or 60p, visit sdp.io slash y60. And I'll talk about the benefits and drawbacks of shooting at 60 frames a second. Let's talk about using aperture priority here. On the mode dial, if you're shooting stills, you'll flip the mode dial over to A. And this gives you complete control over the f-stop by using the back dial here. So now you can see I will adjust the f-stop using the back dial. This is the f-value here, and it's showing the possible values on that scale. And the camera is going to adjust the shutter speed and the ISO probably to give me the proper exposure. If you aren't familiar with f-stop, or if you just want to know everything about aperture and f-stop, there's a lot to know. <laughs> Visit sdp.io slash f-stop for a free video. This is basically what's happening inside your lens as you're changing the f-stop. That opening with low f-stop values is really big, and with high f-stop values, it's really small. Of course, small openings let in less light, which means your image will either get darker or you'll have to use a slower shutter speed or higher ISO to offset that and get a properly bright image. The other major side effect of aperture is changing the amount of background blur. This is just a set of three example shots at f1.8 with an 85 millimeter full frame camera. You can see the background is very blurred, isolating the subject. At f22, it shows the background, adding in a bunch of context. This is your creative choice, whether you're shooting stills or video, how much you want to isolate the subject from the background. If you're shooting video, though, you probably don't want to be using a super low f-stop number with a lot of background blur unless you're very carefully controlling the situation. Because if you're filming somebody and I, for example, move forward a little bit, I'm going to suddenly be out of focus and the shot will be ruined. If you watch big movies and such with professional actors, and it, they will shoot with shallow depth of the field, but you'll see that the actor very carefully always stays within the focal plane. That's a skill that actors have. If you're shooting documentary or vlogging or stuff, your characters might not have that same level of skill. Therefore, it's probably easier for you to just use a higher f-stop number. Let's talk about controlling the uh, shutter speed. Actually, before we move on, 
the A here on the mode dial is for shooting aperture priority for stills. If you want to shoot aperture priority for video, it's a different story. It's, it's one of my biggest complaints about the user interface of the GH5 is how this works. For video, you'll still switch to the movie mode here. Now on the back screen, see how it has a little camera and a P icon there? I'll touch that, and then I'll switch the exposure mode to A, aperture priority. And now I can control the f-stop with the back dial. Weird, right? I wish they gave me the option to make the P, A, S, and M modes just relate to video, because those are the ones I'm, I really only use this camera for video, mostly for video. If you are interested in how to properly set the shutter value for stills for capturing action or showing motion, visit sdp.io slash shutter. But basically, a slow shutter speed, like one eighth of a second, will show a lot of motion, which it conveys a lot of uh, the action in the scene. A high shutter speed freezes motion, giving you sharper pictures, but at the same time, maybe telling a very different story. So you, as a stills photographer or filmmaker, control the shutter speed to tell that story differently. In shutter speed in video, higher shutter speeds do indeed give you sharper images, but they can also give you a very jerky image that seems like this. So there's this old kind of rule about what we call a 180 shutter, 180 degree shutter that comes from the film days, where your shutter speed should be twice what your current frame rate is. So if you're shooting at 24 frames a second, your shutter speed will be 1 50th. If you're shooting at 30 frames a second, it'd be 1 60th. And if you're shooting at 60 frames a second, it would be at 1 1 20th of a second. You don't have to comply with that. People rarely follow that rule and nobody ever complains because we would know because people complain on YouTube and we make videos all the time. And we often don't follow that rule. So it's, it's not a huge deal. But I did kind of want to cover what that priority is. Um, if you want to control the shutter speed for stills, just put the mode dial here to S. If you want to control it for video, you're going to go back to the video mode here and then touch that indicator up here and then touch S for shutter speed. And now you'll control the shutter speed with the back dial. Switch between aperture and shutter priority mode changes the personality of this back dial. It changes what it actually does. If you're out shooting and you're trying to use a wide open aperture and you find you can't get your shutter speed to the right value, add yourself an ND filter. Um, we use a graduated ND filter that matches the front element of the lens to allow us to adjust to different brightness conditions when we do care about the shutter speed, which is sometimes. Manual mode allows you to control both the aperture and the shutter speed, and optionally the ISO, but you can go into manual mode, control those two values, and still let the camera adjust the auto exposure by changing the ISO. Uh, for detailed information about how to select the proper values for manual mode, visit this video here, stp.io slash go manual. If you're shooting stills with this camera, you'll take the mode dial and put it over to M. Now, the back dial here changes the shutter speed, just like it did in shutter priority mode. The front dial here will change the aperture. So you can dial both these with your forefinger and your thumb and pick your perfect settings for whatever the situation is. And for video, this is a really common approach to getting the image you want. If you are shooting video, you'll take the mode dial here, of course, put it back on the video mode. Then touch this link in the upper left corner, select M, and it behaves exactly the same way. Now we're changing the aperture and the shutter speed. One note, I'm in 60 frames per second mode right now. Didn't mean to do that. It will let me go with a slower shutter speed than 60 frames a second. It's letting me go all the way down to 30 frames a second, but you don't want to do that. You want to keep the shutter speed at your frame rate or higher, or it will start doubling out frames and give you jerkier video. You know what I mean? You're not benefiting from all the smoothness of it. If you're shooting stills and you want to take a, an, a long exposure, you might want to use bulb mode. And I'll show you what bulb mode is now. To use bulb mode, put the camera into manual mode. Now, I can uh, move the back dial here to select a really long shutter speed. If I keep scrolling to the left, to the left, to the left, I can go all the way to 60 seconds here. So that would be a one minute exposure, which you would only do if you were in near darkness in a rural environment away from any sort of city lights. But you might do a long exposure like that to get pictures of the stars. You could certainly do that with this camera. If I scroll one more left, I'm gonna get into bulb mode. And bulb mode will keep the shutter open for as long as I want, basically. But the trick is that I have to hold my finger down on the shutter. So as I hold my finger down on the shutter, you can hear the shutter close. 
And if I keep my finger on there for 10 minutes, I will take a 10 minute exposure. But you probably don't want to do that <laughs> because you'd shake the camera around and whatnot. Uh, a better option is to connect an external remote shutter trigger. There's this little flap here on the right side. If you pull it open, you see a little port there and you can pick yourself up a GH5 remote. Don't get a name brand one, get one of the off brand ones and plug it in there and then lock the shutter open for as long as you need. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about it because I don't imagine a lot of GH5 users are doing those types of long exposures. If you happen to get caught without a remote shutter trigger, uh, or if you don't feel like buying one, I have some tricks in this video that will allow you to get long exposures by stacking them in software. So visit sdp.io slash filter for those tricks. Hey, I'm going to take a second and plug my stuff. <laughs> if you want to learn the basics of camera settings, photography, and video, get my book Stunning Digital Photography. The ebook is only 10 bucks. It includes 14 hours of high quality video. So you can read it, you can watch the online videos, and uh, it's going to teach you a lot about composition and lighting. Uh, not just aperture and shutter speed and all that. Of course, I cover all those basic technical details, but also the creative and artistic side of it. And that's the part that really matters more. Because right now, I'm teaching you the buttons and dials of your camera, but that's like just showing somebody where the steering wheel and the gas is on a car and then expecting them to drive. No, there's more to it than that. You need a little savvy, right? If you get into post-processing, I have books on Adobe Lightroom, the most popular app for organizing your pictures and doing light editing, or for heavy editing, Adobe Photoshop. We have books with, for both with tons of video in each. Uh, they're the best reviewed books out there. And of course, my photography buying guide for all your gear questions, things like what focus breathing means and what parfocal lenses are, the types of things you might be curious about if you're into stills or video. It can, this book can save you thousands of dollars by helping you choose the right gear the first time, helping you select used gear, deciding whether or not you want to buy gray market gear and whatnot. Um, don't take my word for it. Go to Amazon and look at the reviews that people have written about them. People love those books. You can go to sdp.io slash store and buy it from us directly or just go to Amazon and, and search for Tony Northup. The ebooks are 10 bucks. The paperback books are more because, you know, paper. Let's talk about how to change your ISO. If you want to know what ISO is, visit sdp.io slash ISO. But in a nutshell, it's your camera sensitivity. To adjust the ISO on this camera, you will hit the ISO button on the top. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> I'll push that and then I can just move the back dial here to adjust my ISO all the way up or down. You can see the max ISO is 25,600 for stills and the minimum ISO is 200. Almost all the time, I'm just in auto ISO mode, especially for stills. I just select auto ISO and then I adjust the exposure compensation as needed. If you switch to video mode, your ISO is limited to 12,800. If that's not high enough, I suggest getting a faster lens. I'll talk about lenses at the end of this video, but that's getting a faster lens with a lower f-stop number like an f1.4 lens is usually going to be the solution to shooting in low light. However, I've also just shot at ISO 12,800 video and let it be underexposed if it was just too dark to, to where I just needed to go higher. Let it be underexposed and then in your photo edit, your video editing app like Premiere, uh, raise the exposure a stop and you will get okay image quality. It, in other words, you can push the exposure a stop for the video if you really need to. But again, faster lenses are usually going to be the better option. Let's talk about how to enable an extended ISO because this camera will let you shoot at ISO 100 and this is a setting I would recommend everybody change. So hit the menu button. Go up to C wrench, <laughs> custom settings, go to exposure. And then the second option down here is extended ISO. Turn that on. And now what that means for me is when I go in and change the ISO, my upper limit is still the same, but my lower limit goes all the way down to 100. And this can cause raw files to lose one stop of potential exposure recovery. And if you don't know what all that means, then it doesn't matter. Just turn it on. Use ISO 100 whenever you want the best image quality, and you should be happy about it. If you search my YouTube channel for extended ISO, you'll see I've made a whole video about this and really thought it out, but it works pretty well. Let's talk about exposure compensation. You've been adjusting your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO to kind of change different exposure values. 
Um, but sometimes your image is simply going to be too bright or too dark. Exposure compensation adjusts for that. So if I point this at the screen here, you can see my screen is white. But as we look at it, it looks kind of dark. Well, I'm in manual mode now. To you use exposure compensation, you either have to have auto ISO on or be in one of the auto exposure modes. So let's just go into program mode to make life easy. And I'll change the ISO back to auto ISO, which it probably should have been. Okay. So as we look at the screen now, I can see you know, it's, it's a white screen, but it just looks kind of gray. To fix that, I'm going to hit the exposure compensation button, the little plus or minus here, press that. And now I can just move this back dial until it's nice and bright. So this, yeah, there we go. I want to kind of expose to the highlights, not blow stuff out too much. So that ended up taking two stops of exposure compensation. We can see now it looks quite a bit better. A great way to make sure you nail the exposure is to turn on the histogram, which is hidden by default. To turn it on, you'll hit the menu button here. You're going to go down to the custom settings here with the wrench, oh, that one, and then go to monitor display. So I'll select that and then on page four out of six, so many options, I'll scroll down to histogram and I'm going to turn that on. So now you can see it's letting me kind of put the histogram wherever I want it. I can just drag it around and like, let's just stick it in the bottom corner down here. And what that's doing is over to the right where the image is bright, those bars go up. And then when the image is dark, the bars go up on the left side. So the dark is on the left, the bright is on the right. As I move it around and the picture becomes brighter, you can see the little histogram there moves towards the right. If I go towards where the image is darker, you can see it moves to the left. And what this allows me to know is whether or not I'm overexposing the image. So if I'm going to be adjusting the exposure compensation, I really should be using that histogram. See how adjusting the exposure compensation moves that histogram around? This, by looking at the histogram here, I can see it's crammed against the right side. I know I'm blowing the image out. Those highlights are going to be lost, and that's especially important in video. But if I roll it down to the left, I can see, oh, now there's a little bit of room on the right. I'm not blowing anything out. I should be able to recover everything, and I'm all clear. Another way to turn to check to make sure you're not uh, blowing out the exposure is to go back to the same settings here and scroll down to zebra pattern. So we'll select that and we'll do set. And now you can see they give you the option of zebra one and zebra two. Zebra one will mark the screen with lines when it's at 80% brightness and zebra two will mark it at 100% when it's definitely overexposed. Um, I prefer, you can change those two. I pretty much just always use zebra two because I only want to know if I'm absolutely blowing part of it out. So you can see it's telling me that this part of the screen is being blown out. Therefore, I'd want to go in and adjust that exposure compensation down until, okay, there we go. Now we're in the clear. Nothing is lost. For detailed information about using exposure compensation, visit stp.io slash ec. Bracketing is a technique old school film photographers used to use to make sure that at least one exposure was the right exposure because you didn't get to see your exposure on the back of the camera. There was no histogram. So if you wanted to make sure you nailed it, you took multiple pictures at different exposures, usually three pictures, and then you'd throw two of them out. You would just, when you got back to the dark room, you would just pick the one that was the right exposure. If you want to use bracketing, it's still a common technique for HDR photography. I have a whole chapter on HDR photography and stunning digital photography if you want to understand that. To configure bracketing on this camera, what you'll do is you'll hit the exposure compensation button that we were just working with. You'll hit that. And then in the upper left corner here, you can touch the screen here and select the type of bracketing you want to do. So this is showing you different exposures. And for me, I'm usually at five and one. This is going to take five separate shots with one stop of exposure between them. So if you took the first and the last exposure, they would actually be four stops apart. You can go all the way up to seven shots with one stop of exposure. But let's do this. Five shots at one stop of exposure each. I'll select that. And then I'm just going to take five pictures. Having really fast, right? I hit the play button here. And as I scroll back to the first one, you can see this is the camera's auto exposure. The second one is a stop darker. The second one is a stop brighter. And then two stops darker. And then two stops brighter. You could later just pick the right exposure or you could stack them with HDR software, software chapter 11 and SDP. I don't often use flash with this camera because I just prefer natural light. But if you do want to use flash, it has a flash hot shoe. 
So you could put in a micro four thirds flash in there and get all sorts of control over it. Uh, you can use remote shutter systems and remote flash systems and stuff like that. Now let's talk about the different shutter modes. When you get your camera, it's probably in single shutter mode, which is this single box here. That means one picture. If I push the shutter button down, it takes one picture. Even if I hold the finger down, it's still only going to take one picture. Uh, that's okay. But almost everything benefits from taking a couple of pictures because sometimes, even if the entire scene is still, when you push that shutter button down, you twist the camera a little bit, and I can just add a little bit of shake to it. So I will often take two or three pictures at least, especially if it's a moving subject, even a portrait. People have little micro expressions where they might be a little uncomfortable and then they'll be okay, or they might blink. If you were to snap off three pictures, you could just pick the best one. It doesn't cost you anything, right? So I'll switch to continuous mode here. I'll just flip this dial over to the stack of boxes. <laughs> and now when I hold the shutter button down, it's going to take a whole bunch of pictures real fast, right? If that's too fast for you, you can slow it down. Here's how you do that. Hit the uh, Q menu button here, FN2, hit that. And then at the top here, you'll see you can scroll through a bunch of different options. I'm going to scroll over to this stack of copies where it says H. <laughs> and now I can put it in medium or low. You also notice in the description at high speed mode, it says without live view. That means if you're shooting in high speed mode, you're seeing the last image you took, which is going to be a little bit delayed. That's fine if it's mostly still pictures, but if you're shooting sports, that means that what you see is lagging behind the real world. And so if you're tracking a moving subject, you will eventually be behind. You will start to lose that subject. It'll move out of the frame and you won't realize it until after they've left because you're slightly behind in time. It's like this weird time shifting thing starts happening and messes with your brain. You can fix that by dropping down to medium speed, which is almost as fast. So now that it's in medium speed, you can see it's shooting a little bit slower, but the view I'm getting is more real time um, and it's, it's still flashing like that. It behaves like a DSLR would. So for a lot of things, you'll want to be shooting at medium speed, if nothing else, to slow down the number of pictures that you're taking. This camera also has an interval timer built into it. Um, first, let's talk about the delayed shutter. The delayed shutter is super useful because if you're taking, say, a macro shot where you want everything to be sharp, again, pushing that shutter button can shake the camera. You might also use a delayed shutter when you want to take a selfie. You'll put the camera on a tripod, and then you run and put your arm around your family, and uh, it'll take the picture after you've already moved. So the shutter dial here has that option. We'll just move it over to the clock icon. And now when I go to take a picture, you can see it's counting down 10 seconds. Uh, well, it's not actually counting down, but it is blinking up here. It assumes you're not behind the camera. Oh, it's getting more intense. There we go. And let's see, what did we take? Oh, well, there's a very poorly lit and out of focus Justin because I didn't do a very good job of taking the picture. But that's the shutter timer. If 10 seconds is too long, if you want to change that, you'll hit the uh, Q menu button here, FN2. Scroll over to the last icon here. Now you can see it says 10 seconds and you have a couple of different options. The default is 10. You could do 10 seconds with three pictures. That's even better for your family selfie because, you know, the first one's going to be ruined by somebody doing this or blinking or sticking their tongue out. But if you shoot three pictures, you might catch those little bastards by surprise and get them with a normal face. Uh, if you select the last option here, it does a two second shutter delay, um, which is good. Just two seconds. It's good for when you have the camera on a tripod and you want to eliminate any shake from pushing the shutter button. The interval timer is useful for taking time lapses. You can take a whole ton of stills on a regular basis and then drop them into your, your video editing app and make a proper time lapse out of it. It's such a common technique now. I see it used all the time in TV and movies. And you can get pro time lapse results with this. Just use this last option on the shutter dial here. That's the interval timer. And now you can see it, it brings up a little display. You can see start time now, shooting interval one minute, image count one. To adjust that, I'm going to hit this little icon on the screen here. And now I'm in the time lapse animation mode. So I can shoot, choose. Uh, time lapse shot or stop motion animation. With stop motion animation, you trigger it. So you basically would be moving a puppet and then triggering it to take the next picture and move a puppet. But time lapse is the more common one where it just fires automatically on a regular interval to make a time lapse video. Start time now, that's usually what you're going to do. Um, I will change the start time. If I'm in a hotel with a view, I'm taking a time lapse. 
I promise you. And sometimes I'll want to see the sun rise, but I don't want to get up before the sunrise. So I'll set the camera up and uh, trigger it to go off at 4.30 or whenever before the sun rises. Um, I'll use an app called, uh, I think it's called Sun Seeker that will, on my phone, that will tell me in augmented reality exactly where the sun is going to rise. So I'll line everything up based on that, trigger it to start automatically, and then I can just keep sleeping. And when I wake up, I have a beautiful time lapse, unless something got messed up, which happens sometimes. The next option down here allows you to configure the shooting interval and the interval, the image count. So I'll adjust that. One minute is usually too much, but you know, four seconds, one second. And then the image count, for the, for the most part, I, I'll just select the maximum value here. Let's just say 9,000. Because you can always interrupt it. And if you have too many time-lapse pictures, that's never a problem. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I made a time-lapse and then go to render it and realize I didn't take enough pictures. Especially if you're shooting in 60 frames a second, remember, you will need 60 still pictures to fill one minute of video. Uh, I always try to make my time lapses at least 12 seconds. That, you know, on screen, a good like 6 to 8 to 10 seconds is good if you're using a time lapse as an establishing shot or some B-roll or something. Um, but you want to give yourself a little leeway at the beginning and end for maybe doing a cross dissolve or something. Um, so to figure out how many shots you need, then you'll, you'll take, maybe it's 10 seconds at 60 frames per second. That means you need 600 shots. If you're going to be shooting for uh, 10 minutes, then you'll need to divide 10 minutes, which is 600 seconds by 600 shots, which means a 10 minute time lapse would have you shooting at one second intervals. And then you would be able to stitch that together to create a 10 second time lapse. See how that works? So I actually wish you could set the interval to be a fraction of a second, because I'd like it to be nice and silky smooth. But again, having too many pictures is not going to be a problem. So feel free to, if you're not sure, just use one second and 9,000 pictures and cut it off early if you just can't stand to hang out anymore. Let's talk about the different focusing modes, because by default, the way this camera works is, oh, I need to take it off time-lapse mode. Let's get back into continuous shooting. By default, it will find focus and then stop focusing as soon as it locks on focus. So if I recompose up here, you can see it's not refocusing. This will let you do a technique called focus recompose, where if you want to focus on an off-center uh, off part of the image, you can just lock focus in by holding the shutter halfway and then move the frame. That's not really necessary because you can focus right to the corners. So there's no, don't do focus recompose. Just set your focusing point where you need it to. Uh, uh, IFS, which is the single focusing that we're experiencing, where it stops tracking focus even if you move the camera or the subject moves, that's the most accurate type of focusing on this camera. And it's what we use most of the time. If you're shooting a moving subject, flying bird, sports, car driving towards you, you want to use AFC. You can configure the, the focusing mode really conveniently. I love this dial. It's this big rotary dial here. I'll flip that from AFS to AFC. And now as I hold the shutter button down, you can see I can get closer here, and it's going to keep that in focus up until I hit the minimum focusing distance. So now it's tracking moving subjects. It does it pretty well. It does a pretty good job of that. The uh, next option here is MF, which stands for manual focus. So you can see as I turn that, it popped up a little magnifier to help me nail the focus, bam, manual focus. So if you're coming from an SLR world, you might be used to finding the manual focus, autofocus switch on the lens. It's really nice that it's built right into the body here. For detailed information about different focusing modes, visit sdp.io slash focus. That's just a free video from us. Those focusing modes have no relationship to the focusing modes during video. Those are for stills. I hate this about this camera. I wish they would just let me make it a video only camera. Uh, so you can put this into AFC in your video or AFS, and it's not going to make any difference. This style isn't useful to you if you're shooting video. To configure the video focusing modes, I'll put the camera into video mode here. And now I need to hit the menu button. And I'm going to go over to the manual movie thing, M movie. 
And let's just scroll down some. I'm going to go over to the, the second icon down, the little movie icon here. And I'm going to go down to continuous AF. Right now it's on. I'm going to turn it off. You are almost always going to want to have continuous AF off when you're shooting video because until there's a firmware update or something, I don't consider it to be that reliable. It will, you'll be filming a completely still subject and then suddenly it will latch onto something in, in the back of the frame. It's always focusing on something, but it will often grab onto focus on something in, in the back of the frame. If you're doing unboxing videos or something where you're holding something close to the camera and you want it to snap into focus, that's the right option for you. In our review of this camera, I gave an overview of how to use the different focusing modes to the best effect. Uh, so rather than repeat myself here, I'm going to send you to watch that review. Go to scp.io slash gh5 review and you'll see me give you tips on how to nail focus with vlogging. Um, I use the Wi-Fi app when I'm too far away. I use AFS whenever possible and then I resort to the AFC with a single small autofocus point. Um, when I absolutely need it to track moving subjects. Let's talk about how to change the focusing points. By default, when you're shooting, it's, you can see it's going to focus anywhere. And that's dumb. That's really dumb. You really want to let the camera like look at the whole frame and decide, oh, I think I'll focus here. No, you want to pick a single focus point and tell it where to focus if you're not manually focusing. It's pretty easy to switch. So the way you'll switch that is you hit the quick menu button here, FN2. And then go over to the focusing point thing here. And here you can select from different types of focusing points. So if I go over to the left, I can turn on face and eye detection. It will automatically focus on an eye. Or if it doesn't find an eye, it will allow you to move the focusing point around. But here's what I use most of the time is the pinpoint. This gives you a very small focusing point that's really important for focusing on, say, somebody's eye. Okay, it's, it's having a hard time. It's having a hard time because pinpoint AAF is also the slowest type of autofocus. So it's very, it's highly accurate and it's very precise, but it's the slowest because the camera isn't looking at a big part of the frame and allowing itself to focus anywhere in there. Um, so use that when you have to. And again, that's what I use most of the time when I really want to nail the focus, but there are other options available. The one area is a much bigger option, but you can see the box there itself is pretty big. And that's big enough that the camera might focus on somebody's forehead rather than their eye. And that would just totally ruin a portrait. So in those cases, you'd want to switch back to the pinpoint focusing. Um, I didn't really demonstrate it, but this thumbstick here allows you to move the focusing point around. You can also just drag it around like that. While it's there, I can use the back dial here to control the size of the focusing point, making it bigger and faster or smaller and mo more precise. So often I'll make it as small as I need to. If I'm just tracking somebody's face, I'll make it as big as the face. Otherwise, it's going to be a little bit smaller if I need to be more precise. There's another focusing mode to be aware of. And that is the tracking mode. What this will do is you select that. Let's track that P. Sounds dirty. I'll select it and then, oh, there we go. Look, it's tracking the P. See how it's like following it around? And that will allow the subject to move throughout the frame and have me continuing to shoot it. But if you use like a D500, it doesn't work quite that well. I just wanted to show you where it was. If you change as any setting, after you're done, I would go back and change that setting back, especially as you're experimenting or if it's some specialized situation, because what you don't want is to grab your camera later and urgently try to get a shot and find out your, your bracketing turned on and the wrong focusing mode and stuff. It's just a pain. Let's go a little deeper into manual focus. I showed you how to select it earlier by shifting this dial over to MF. And now I can use the ring on the lens to manually focus and you can see it's pulling in and out. There are a lot of different options for um, manually focusing though. And the first is to autofocus. So as I'm manually focusing, I can see this little AF button down here. I can just hit that and it will autofocus it for me. <laughs> Sometimes I know you want to be extreme and do everything manual, but it's nice when the camera can just jump in there and help you get the shot. 
another uh, set of options allow provide different focusing assist modes. So I hit the menu button here, and I'll go into custom settings and then monitor display. And when I select that, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I can turn on. Just have to get to the right page. Um, one here is peaking. You can see that I currently have it on because I use it all the time. If you select it, you can go down to set and choose how you want it to be configured. Peaking will find the parts of the frame that are the sharpest, really those parts that are in focus, and highlight it so you know when you found focus in that area and it's not precise. It should not be relied on for precise focusing, but it's a good way to get roughly in the area. The magnification is a much more precise way. So you can select different focus peaking colors, and what you want is a color that contrasts with your situation. So if your client is wearing a yellow shirt, you wouldn't want to choose the yellow display color. You'd want to choose blue or something that was obviously contrasting. So to see how the focus peaking works, let's zoom in there, and then I will get that area kind of in focus. Where is it? Oh, there we go. So you can see that U there, as I get it sharp and focus, see how it has that green line around it? And as I move the camera in and out, you can kind of see that green line follow the focal plane. That's what focus peaking does. It's useful. You can also configure the MF assist, which is that magnification window that pops up. So under the same group, the autofocus settings here uh, on page two, you'll see MF assist. And I always keep this set to this option, which is the default. That magnifies it. Um, down here, you see the option for MF Assist Display. And by default, it's picture in picture. So it shows you a little window. If you want to take up the full screen, you can go to full here. And so now when I autofocus, you can see it'll pop right in, just automatically punches in. And that's, that's super useful for getting precise focus. And then you can just half push the shutter to zoom back and see the full display. One more setting, if you find yourself autofocusing and then wanting to fine tune it with manual focus, go to that same group in the menu system and select AF plus MF and just turn that to on. So now, with that turned on, if I'm in autofocus modes, and so now when I push, half push the shutter, it will autofocus, and then as long as I have the shutter pushed down, I can manually focus by turning the ring. So it's kind of providing you the best of both worlds. Now let's talk about the different metering modes. Metering is the logic that the camera uses to determine the proper exposure, and you can just always leave it on the default and never worry about this. I discussed this in chapter, chapter three of stunning digital photography, but if you do decide that you wanna change it, you just wanna to ignore Tony's advice and go and change your metering mode, fine, who am I to stop you? Uh, the easiest way to do that is to hit the Q menu here, FN2, and then go down to this option in the lower right, lower left corner. And here you can see I can choose between multi-metering, center-weighted metering, and spot metering. Again, just leave it on multi-metering. If you're gonna change that, it's because you already know how to do it. Another option you don't necessarily need to change uh, for stills, especially if you're shooting raw, but you might wanna change for video is the white balance. You might wanna just nail the white balance so that the color isn't looking a little too orange or a little too green. To do that, you can use the WB button on top of the camera. So push that. And now you can select from whatever type of lighting you're in. Like this is incandescent light, this is sunlight, or, you know, auto white balance works pretty good. If you want to fine tune that, you can hit adjust here and then just dial it in however you want to really make sure that it's perfect. If you're working with lights that you know the color temperature of, like maybe you're working with 5300 Kelvin lights, hit that white balance button and scroll over to these custom settings here. And now you can see I get the option for white balance custom set. Now I can just dial it down to 5300 or whatever it is and hit set. And then everything should be nice and white. Uh, you also have some options for custom settings here that you can easily recall. So I can go to that and make my white balance off of a white card or a gray card. So all I need to do is to fill the frame with that, with whatever's white there and then hit set. And bam, it made sure that that part of the frame was white. Do that before you film and you will save yourself some post-processing, right? We have only scratched the surface on the complex video features of this camera. So let's dive more into the specific video stuff, like the different recording formats. You can choose from all sorts of different codecs 
frame rates, resolutions, but I'll show you the one that I use for just everything pretty much. First, make sure you're in the video mode here, or camera and the M, and then I'll hit the menu button. And I'll go up to the video camera here, and you can see a couple of different related options. Uh, recording format and recording quality, and you're going to kind of use those in tandem. Now, for the most part, I will use MP4, and that's fine. MP4 LPCM can be a little bit higher quality, so we can select that if we want the absolute best quality. And then under recording quality here, you'll select your absolute, uh, you'll, you'll select your resolution and your frame rate. So if we scroll up here, the highest resolution frame rate is going to be 3840 by 2160 at 5994, basically 60 frames a second. That's what we shoot almost everything in. You'll notice a couple of different options here. This is 420 at 8-bit and 150 megabits a second. That's a high frame rate, which means you will see almost no compression artifacts. It's a super clean, high-quality video. If you scroll down a couple of options, you can drop the compression to 100 megabits per second, and that means your file sizes will be a little bit smaller. Your quality will be almost the same, but your life will be a little bit easier because you won't be burning through storage quite as fast. It's something to consider. Also note that it says here VFR available, which means you can do things like adjust the frame rate to something slower. However, this drops you down to 30 frames a second, so we're no longer at 60 frames a second. The VFR is not available at 60 frames a second. It's only available at 30 frames a second. So for me, I'm up here at the 60 frames a second, and I'm happy with it. If you scroll up from there, you can see a couple of options at proper 4K, like Cinema 4K, which is a wider format. It's 4096 by 2160. The highest you can go here, though, is 24 frames a second. Now, you have two options for the Cinema 4K 4096. You have... 100 megabit and 8 bit 420, or you have the 10 bit and 150 megabits a second. The 10 bit adds more color information to the video and will, might require a little bit of extra processing. At the moment, Premiere is struggling with the 10 bit GH5 files a little bit. And in our testing, we have yet to perceive any difference between the 8 bit and the 10 bit video. So we've just been shooting 8 bit. Uh, I've seen other people testing these things and really trying to push it and try to see some benefit to the 10 bit. And none of us have really seen any benefit to the 10 bit. So if I were you, I just wouldn't sweat it. But if you have a boss who's telling you to need to shoot 10 bit, if you're shooting for consistency with other cameras, if you want 10 bit, there it is. If you don't know what that means, don't sweat it. Just shoot. 38, 40, 21, 60, 60p, and don't worry about the, the 8 bit or 10 bit. If you do want 10 bit, note that if you scroll down a little bit, you do have the option of shooting at 422 and 10 bit at 38, 40 by 21, 60 at 30 frames a second. So if you're on a 30 frames per second format or you're shooting 24 frames a second, uh, you have the option of jumping up to, to 10 bit and getting that extra just color resolution, maybe a little bit better quality. I'm not going to get into which is actually better. Let's talk about the e-stabilization. This camera actually has three forms of stabilization. There's optical stabilization in, in those lenses that are power OIS, or any like adapted Canon lenses that have image stabilization. The lens will move physical elements around to stabilize stuff. Then you have sensor stabilization. Well, the sensor will actually move around, taking still photos or video, to offset things like the twist of the camera, uh, those will work in tandem if you have Panasonic lenses. If you use other lenses, they will not work in tandem. Most Panasonic lenses, not all of them. But if you put a Canon lens on there, if you put an Olympus lens on there, the, it'll be one or the other. It'll use these sensors, the, the lens stabilization if it has it, otherwise it will fall back to the sensor stabilization. The third form of stabilization is e-stabilization, which is available when shooting video only, not available for stills. What that does is it will pull from different pixels on the sensor to keep your image stabilized. So it's moving like this around the edges of the frame. And of course, it's, if the sensor is here and the image that it's pulling is here, it needs a little bit of room around the edges, right? So it will have to, when you turn on e-stabilization, it will crop the image in a little bit to allow it to freely move around the frame some. Um, I find e-stabilization in its current form to be 
good for handheld static shots. If I'm like this and I want the, to want to be like a human tripod, it will make a difference. It will help. If I'm walking and I turn on e-stabilization, it looks weird. It's all like, rrr, rrr. so I don't do that. So I'm, I'm often turning e-stabilization on and off. To change it, you'll hit the menu button here. You'll go over to the little movie icon here and then scroll down some. Go to stabilizer and then e-stabilization video and you can turn it on. Again, great for static shots. Moving shots, I mean, you decide, but me personally, I don't like it. Um, I will talk in a little bit about how to set custom modes. You can see I have C1, C2, and C3 here. I, on my own personal camera, I've set C1 to be e-stabilization off and a wide format full frame. And then C2 is e-stabilization on and it cropped in a little bit to give me a little bit of extra reach. So that way I don't have to go into the menus. I'll just switch between them, but just hold out. We'll get to that in a bit. I feel anxious about this. The virtual teleconverter will give you a little bit of crop whether or not you use the e-stabilization. I'll hit the menu button here under the movie icon. You'll see on page three, X tel teleconv, that's the teleconverter. So let's do a practice. I'll turn the teleconverter off and then let's zoom in on, now the whole frame is filled with the word teleconverter. Now I'll turn that teleconverter on and bam. You can see now it's cropped in pretty tight. This is such an awesome feature because sometimes you'll be at your lens's limit. You'll be, you know, you, this is my 14 to 140, my favorite all around lens. I'll be at 140, but I'll actually want to be at like 180. I turn that teleconverter on, bang, I got that extra reach. Again, I set it to C2 in my custom settings. So if I want that extra reach, I just bam, I got it. Great feature. I love that you have that little bit of crop. The Sony's have that too. Let's talk about slow and fast motion. So this is like slow mo, like or you can do fast, like little time lapses built into it. Uh, to turn that on, you'll go into the menu system here. You'll need to go up to the recording quality here and select a recording quality that has this, the VFR available in video mode. Those other qualities won't allow you to set the VFR. It's such a confusing interface. So you just have to remember this. So I'll set that. Now with that set, I go up to this top icon, the manual movie mode. And then the second option here is variable frame rate. This is such a confusing way to do slow motion. I'll go down to set and now I can select the actual frame rate. So you can see I can drop it down to two frames a second, which would be like 1500%, like I'd be moving really fast. Or I can slow it down. I'm at, the recording frame rate is 30 frames per second now. I could have it record at 60 frames a second, but tell the video processing software that it's 30 frames a second, and it would be at half speed. So we'll do that. And now when I record stuff, it'll come back at half speed. That's useful. But at the same time, if you just record at 50 frames a, or 60 frames a second, you can just slow it down in your video editing app to half speed. And it would be exactly the same thing without having to mess with that. So just keep that in mind. If you want to go above 60 frames per second recording time, you can do that too. So I'll hit menu here. We'll go back to the menu icon, the movie icon, and we'll change the recording mode to HD, 1080. I want to look for this VFR available, that option. I'm going to go back up here, variable frame rate, it's such a weird user interface choice. And now I can go all the way to 180 frames a second. So now you can see the slow fast effect is, well, the recording frame rate is 60 frames a second, the slow fast effect is 33%. So it's recording three times more frames than necessary. So you can slow it down basically 300%. Or if you were publishing at 30 frames a second, you could slow it down up to 6x. Um, that's super slow. I tried to record somebody running and it was so slow, it was like boring. At 180 frames per second, the video quality is bad. It's just bad, it will look bad. If you want decent video quality, drop it down to 120 frames a second. If you're publishing at 30, that's still four times slow motion and everything will just look better. So just keep in mind, you can go to 180, but it's, it's gonna look bad. C3 up here, I set that to slow motion variable frame rate because it's such a pain to go back in and set it up and then have to go back. 
So I have to, because I didn't do that on this camera, I have to go back and reset my video settings. Let's talk about Vlog, which is Panasonic's variation of the logging video, which captures, which makes everything look like shades of gray and super washed out, but it's actually capturing more detail in the shadows and more detail in the highlights. You probably don't want this. We have it and we never use it. It's kind of a pain to process. It's kind of a pain to expose. It makes it really easy to make a serious mistake that will mess up your video. I don't recommend, I actually don't recommend most people use it. But if you want a log format, if you want to make sure you capture all those, then you already want it. You can pick it up at Amazon at sdp.io slash vlog. Um, what the way the process works is you go to that link and they will send you a physical card. They will physically mail you a card that has a code written on it. And that little card will come with a set of instructions for how to get vlog installed on your camera because it doesn't come with it. It's an option. It costs like 110 bucks or something like that. That's baffling. I know you're saying to me, no, no, I will just buy the code online so I can get it instantly. You can't do that. I don't know why. You have to have a physical card mailed to you. This was the problem because I had a shoot like the next day and I wanted to use it and I had to wait like a couple of days for them to ship it to me. So if you want it, buy it in advance and plan for that. And also be aware that getting it installed on your camera is a real pain. It comes with instructions. I'm just going to leave that to you. Uh, I do want to point out if you have the vlog installed, you can follow these steps. Go to the menu, go to the creative video mode, and then scroll down to vlog view assist. Uh, which is here. It must be our other camera that has it turned on. Uh, we only turn on one of the two cameras. And use that to read a LUT file, a lookup table file, which will basically cancel out the vlog in the display so you can see what the final product will look like, but it will be still be recording in vlog. That all makes sense to the people who care. So if you don't know, that doesn't make sense. Don't sweat it. Let's talk about how to pull focus. One of the coolest effects you'll see in movie is, movies is there'll be I don't know, somebody in the foreground here and then somebody in the background will be like looking menacingly or holding an ax and they'll just like pull focus from one to the other. But getting that focus to pull smoothly is real hard. Like there are people who's in Hollywood whose job is focus puller and they're just a guy who's really good at turning that smoothly and landing it precisely. The GH5 is awesome because it has this feature built in where you can just like touch the screen and switch between different focusing points. Uh, so let's let's do that now. Here I'm just going to move this stuff around and let's pull out our trusty Olympus here and we'll have it as the menacing person in the background. Um, to, to use focus pulling, I'm going to go into the menu mode. I'm in video mode, by the way. I'm going to go to the creative video option here and then on the last page is focus transition. You'll select that and then what you want to do is go into focus pull setting and you're going to set the positions that you're going to focus on. So I'll start with position one and let's just compose this a little bit. Okay, so there we have a lens in the foreground, a camera in the background, and we're going to pull focus between them. So now I'm going to Minimally focus on this guy in the foreground. There we go. Nailed that focus. Exit, set. And now I'll go to position two. And I'm going to focus on that guy in the background. Where is he? Over here. Okay, good. Nailed the focus. You can see the focus peeking is helping me out there. And then set. And you could set a third position too. You can switch between three of them. And then I'll hit start. And so now, you know, I can be recording video. And now I can go position one, position two, position one, position two. And it's pulling focus nice and smoothly between the two subjects. Pretty cool, right? Keep that in your bag because that's a real easy and cheap way to up your production values, make your videos look great. Let's talk about sound. Good sounds important. You're going to want to use an external mic. I'll suggest a couple of mics um, at the end, including the mic that I'm using now. You will want to, when you're in video mode, make sure that you have the mic levels shown. And they might not be by default. So hit the menu button here, go down to the camera icon, the video camera icon, and then scroll over to mic level display.
and turn that on. Um, right below it, you'll see mic level adjust, where if the levels are coming in too loud or too quiet, you can crank it up or you can crank it down to be a little bit quieter. Um, if you can adjust this from your mic, you should adjust it from your mic too first and then only do that if that still doesn't work. Now, I can see my levels over here. You should also be using headphones, but it helps to make sure that you're not peaking. Just have it there. Let's talk about how to adapt lenses. We adapt Canon lenses all the time using our Metabone Speed Booster. And if you use a Metabone Speed Booster with like autofocus and image stabilization control, you don't have to do anything. You can just put your Metabone Speed Booster on and put your Canon lens on and it works great. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. But if you're using a like a Nikon lens or some sort of manual focus lens like an old lens where it doesn't support those electronic communications and you want to take advantage of that sensor stabilization, because yeah, you can have a 50 millimeter prime from 1950 and have it stabilized with this camera. It's awesome. I'll show you how to do that. You have to set, tell the camera the focal length of it. So to do that, to set that, you'll hit the menu button. You'll go to the video camera icon and then go down to page three or four and then stabilizer. So we'll select that. And then under e-stabilization video, I'll select that and turn it on. And then underneath that, you'll see focal length set. And right now I can't set it because it's talking to the lens. If you can't set it, that's good news. That means it's taking care of it for you. I'll take the lens off, which is exactly the behavior that the camera would see if I had adapted an old lens. So now when I go into the same setting, I can see here focal length set. I can actually go in and set the focal length to whatever the physical focal length is. You do not have to factor in the crop factor of the sensor here. If you attach a 50 millimeter full frame lens to it, just put in 50 millimeters. If you're using a speed booster, you should factor that in like a Metabone speed booster. You would multiply that times the focal length. If you're using a teleconverter, you should also factor that in. So if you have optics in there that are changing the focal length, take that into account, but don't worry about crop factor. Let's talk about how to format a memory card. I'm just gonna show you where this is. Once you fill up your card, back everything up, send it to the cloud somewhere. Don't just trust it on your computer. And then you can go down to the menu, the little wrench icon here, and scroll down to format the very last option and it will give you a chance to format either of the card slots. If you accidentally format a card or you have a card corrupted, go to this link sdp.io slash photo rec. There's a free tool there. You can put your card in your computer, any type of, type of computer really, and it will, it will scour that card for little bits of data and try to recover your pictures for you. Do not pay for a photo recovery app because this free one is great. I suggest shooting RAW for your still images. If you don't know the difference between RAW and JPEG, visit sdp.io slash RAW v JPEG. To turn on RAW shooting, I will put my camera into a photo mode, like program mode, and then I'll hit the menu icon. I'll go to the wrench here. Oh no, I'll go up to the camera icon here. I'll go to quality and then RAW. There we go, now I'm shooting RAW. You can see this is the option for RAW plus JPEG at the same time. You might've noticed that every time I focus, it's like, that is so annoying. Have you ever been a wedding photographer and you have everybody in the audience like beep, 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 beep. Um, I'm gonna show you how to turn off that beeping. So please, please do that. It lights up green and stuff. You can see what it's in focus. You don't need audible confirmation of that. Hit the menu button, go down to the wrench icon. Go down to beep and you'll see uh, beep volume here. Turn that off. Your camera has an electronic shutter, which is generally quiet. It doesn't have to make any sound. You can turn that off from here too and thus make your camera just completely silent. You'll still hear that. That's because that's the mechanical shutter. Uh, if you want to turn the electronic shutter on, it's, it's an option too. Go to the menu button here the camera icon shutter type, and you'll see it says M shutter. That means mechanical. You can set it down to E shutter here. That's electronic. EFC is electronic front curtain shutter. Um, the benefit of mechanical shutter is it freezes motion better, but it makes noise. The electronic shutter doesn't freeze motion as well. So you'll see a little bit of a rolling shutter effect where if the camera's panning, something that's vertical will look tilty. Therefore, mechanical shutter gives you the best quality, but the electronic shutter is good, and it's what I use most of the time because I would rather be discreet. So I pretty much always use this last option here, and with that, you can see I can now take pictures, and it's taking pictures, 
but it's just completely silent. It's so nice to be able to take pictures without disturbing people. Let's talk about how to customize the different function buttons on the camera. So many different custom function buttons, and as you're shooting, you'll find yourself going in and changing different settings more than others. So you can customize those buttons to do whatever you want. By default, they all do something. So you can push those buttons and kind of see what it is that they allow you to do. Like this button here adjusts the white balance. Uh, this button here changes the AF mode. I didn't show you to use those function buttons because I know so many of you are going to change them anyway. That's why I showed you other techniques. But if you want to customize those, and you should, hit the menu button, go to the custom settings option here, the wrench, with the C, and then go to operation. Select that, and on page three is FN button set. So select that, and now you can select different function buttons for either record or playback mode. So let's talk about record mode here. Now you can see all these different buttons that you can customize to your heart's content. Go for it. I don't know what you like. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You can also customize the quick menu. So the quick menu is what pops up when you hit this button here. And it's a lot of these options, like, like I told you, I rarely change the white balance on my stills camera. To change the quick menu, you'll hit the, you'll hit the menu button. You go to that same menu, which is custom wrench operation. Page three, you'll see Q menu here. Select that, and you can do custom. With that turned on, I will now go back out of the menu system, and I'll hit the Q menu button again. And now it gives me this option down here to allow me to drag stuff around and change it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag them from up here down here. So bam, I just replaced that one. I never change out of four and three, so I can just get rid of that one. But I will sometimes shoot in RAR or JPEG. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling from the list of available options up here and dragging them down here. So there's my teleconverter. I'll turn that on. And then I can exit back out of here. So now that I've done that, the options are customized. And every time I go into the quick menu here, you can see I can pick from those three options that I just chose. I highly recommend doing that because those quick menu items, most of them aren't very useful for me. Custom modes. I mentioned it a couple of times, but this custom mode dial up here has these options, these awesome C1, C2, and C3 options. They will take all of your settings and apply them to some state that you've recorded in the past. So if you want to be in shutter priority with a shutter speed of one five hundredths of a second, you can set that to custom one if you want. And the way you'll do that is get your camera set up exactly as you want it because it will remember everything. And then you'll hit the menu button. You go to the wrench icon here and then you'll go to custom set memory. And you can see C1, C2, or then three different C3 options. So I'll set that to C1. I'll overwrite the current settings. And so I just recorded it with a, in shutter priority with 1 500th of a second. So let's just change that shutter speed to something else. And you can see it gets switched between different modes. As soon as I go back to C1, bam, shutter priority, 1 500th of a second. That's so useful. So for me, C1 is... 4K, 60p, full frame, no teleconverter, no e-stabilizer. C2 is 4K, 60p, with the, extra, the teleconverter, the digital teleconverter, with the stabilizer. And then C3 is different varieties of slow motion, like 120 frames a second, 180 frames a second. Um, I'll just show you how to do those different C3 options. So let's get into a video mode here. And... I would adjust those settings and then I'd go to custom set memory and set it to say C3-2 and it will overwrite those. And now in the mode dial up here, I'll switch it over to C3 and I can see up here. See, so I'll click that and this will give me the option to choose between C1, C2, or rather C3-1, C3-2, and C3-3. I don't know why they decided to give you three options on C3, but not C1 or 2. Another way you can customize your settings is to save your settings to a file. And this should be really useful because you'd be able to save your settings to a file and then transfer it to a different camera. For example, we have two GH5s and I randomly switch between them. Justin and I will trade off at some point. 
And if they're not synchronized, then stuff becomes really confusing, especially if you're using those custom settings. So you'd want to, to write those to the memory card and then transfer your memory card to the other one and then read them in. So to do that, what you can do is hit the menu, go down to the wrench icon, and then down at the bottom, the bottom of page three, you'll see save, restore camera setting. I'll select that and then I will save it to a new file. I can name it something here by changing, change the file name. If you want to type on a really annoying keyboard and then I'll click okay and it will save it. Now I could transfer that to slot one of another camera and read it in. Um, I'll say we did this and it did not work as we would have hoped. Um, the second camera received the settings, but then regularly lost the settings. So better luck. I hope it works out better for you. Now I'll tell you how to use back button focus. If you aren't familiar with back button focus, read chapter three of stunning digital photography. It's such a useful technique or visit sdp.io slash BBF. I'm just going to show you how to actually turn it on. I'll go to the custom wrench icon and then focus release shutter. I'll select that and then I'm going to scroll down to shutter AF on page one and select that. So by default, shutter AF is, is on, which means when you have pressed the shutter button, it will autofocus. I'm just going to turn that off. And now, now back button focus is turned on. Um, you'll always be able to use, have this in autofocus mode and then push this back button here to focus. That's your, like, that's your back button focus. Let's talk about Wi-Fi. This camera can communicate wirelessly to your smartphone or tablet. Android, iPhone, whatever. The first step is to get the app installed on your phone. Um, we use Android 2, but I'm going to use the iPhone because it's actually harder. <laughs> Android provides a little more flexibility for app developers. So some, there are some steps that you'll just have, be able to skip. Like it'll connect to the, it'll be able to connect to the network a little bit easier. So search for the Panasonic image app. There it is. I've already installed it. So I'll click open. And you can see right away, it's searching for a camera. The camera's not in Wi-Fi mode yet. So what I'll do is I'll go into the camera here and I'll turn on Wi-Fi mode. I'll go into the menus here, go down to the wrench icon. And then I'll scroll down to Wi-Fi. It's on page one. And I'll turn that on. Now it's firing up. Wi-Fi function and Wi-Fi setup. I'll select Wi-Fi function for now. I'll create a new connection. And you have the option to send images stored on the camera, to send images while you're recording. So every time you click a camera, a picture, it'll send it over, or to remote, remotely control your camera. So for now, let's talk about just transferring pictures we've taken over to a smartphone. So I'm just selecting these options. I will almost always use the direct connection where this acts as a wireless access point. So I'll select direct here and then I'll do a manual connection. And now you can see it's created its own Wi-Fi network with this name, GH5 something. And now I'm going to go onto my smartphone. I'm going to go into the wireless settings here. Um, you want to do this every time. If you're not currently connected to Wi-Fi and you've connected before, it'll automatically link up for you. But now I've selected it. Okay, so now I'm connected and it detected that and told me to switch back to the app. So now you can see it's connecting. My phone's asking me, do you want to connect to this device? Yes, just a security feature. Now on my camera here, it's asking me what I want my settings to be. So for example, you can change the, the image size to original. So instead of having it compressed down to a smaller JPEG, you can send the original file over for higher quality. You don't need to do that um, for things like Instagram, but if you want to get the full size image for editing or something, you can. And then I'll select single select to select a single image. There's a picture of Justin. I will select that. It will say it's going to take a full minute to send it because it lies and it's done. <laughs> Look how quick that was. And now on my smartphone, it appears here and I can zoom in. So this is really great when you want to just quickly send a picture over. If you do want to send raw images through Wi-Fi, you can do it, it just requires an extra step. You have to use the raw converter that's built into the camera, convert it to a JPEG, and then you can send it over. So I'm gonna take a quick raw picture of our camera, Justin over here. 
And now what I'm going to do is review the picture. There he is. And you can see now I try to send it. It says it can't be sent over Wi Fi. I don't know why the software can't just instantly convert it for me. It just requires me to do it manually. So I'll hit the menu button. And I'll go down to the playback menu down here. And then at the bottom of the first page, you'll see raw processing. So I'll select that. And I'm going to choose the file here by clicking set. I can scroll through and pick the right one, but I'll do that one set. And now it brings me to this unusual menu where it's giving me different options for making adjustments to the image. So you can adjust the hue and saturation and brightness and all that. And I think that's all pretty straightforward. You can change the white balance. When you're ready, you can select begin processing, which converts it from raw to JPEG. So let's save it as a new picture. There we go. So now we're on our new picture. And let's go back here and we'll get back to the review menu. And so now I can push this. And now it gives me the op option to upload that via Wi Fi. So let's hope Panasonic listens and gives us a firmware update that will handle that automatically. Maybe you're watching from the future and you'll be able to do that. Another feature that is useful is being able to remotely control it, particularly for vloggers. So let's back up a little bit here. Let's get out of the Wi Fi mode. I'll go back into Wi Fi so we can select a different function setting. Wi Fi function, new connection, and then remote shirt and shooting in view. Now I need to go back to my phone and connect to that Wi Fi network again. Again, this if I weren't home where I have a Wi Fi connection, my phone would probably automatically connect to it, connect to a, the Wi Fi switch back to the app. Okay, so now on my app here, I chose local control. And now I can see what's going on with the camera. And you can see, it knows it's manually focusing. So it's actually giving me a little icon there. Let's focus on this cool camera over here. There we go. Um, and now I have a variety of different options here, like I can make it autofocus if the lens supported autofocus, I can hit the shutter button. Um, I can record video. This is super useful if you need to record yourself. If you're setting up the camera across the room, and you want to run over there and focus on yourself, you put that on there, hit AF, and then hit record and you can make sure your head isn't being cut off and you're properly in focus. The Wi Fi features of the camera also include the ability to automatically upload images to your smartphone as you're kind of taking them. So let's go over how to do that. I'll hit the menu button here. And as I go into the wrench icon, I go down to Wi Fi. We'll select Wi Fi function, I'm going to do a new connection and then send images while recording. It's kind of a wireless tethering. And I'm going to send this to my smartphone, but you can see you can send it to other stuff. And we'll do a direct connection, manual connection, and set up the Wi Fi access point for me. So now I'm going to connect to that on my phone. Camera tells me to launch the image app. So I will do as I'm told. It's connecting to the camera. Select a device to connect to confirm that it's the iPhone. And now you can change the resolution of the images that are coming in. And so now I should be able to just take pictures and have them sent over. Let's take a picture of this lens that's on the desk. Okay, I don't know if that's a bug or what, but it wouldn't let me autofocus in this mode. <laughs> so I had to manually focus, but I took the shot. I can see the Wi Fi indicator here indicates that it's connected. So I can go back to my phone here. You can see it says waiting for M trans. I don't know why they abbreviate <laughs> words like that. We could go ahead and spell that out. You got room. While we're waiting, notice that the blue light here indicates the Wi Fi is on. So now it will transfer pictures in real time, but they have to be JPEG. If you are shooting raw, it will not send them over. So you can shoot raw plus JPEG, but it will not auto convert your picture. So let's make Justin our star here again. Take a picture. Okay. And I can see on my phone look a little spinny thing up here. Registering received pictures. All right, I took a few pictures. So it's sending them all over.
And now it prompts me to check the downloaded pictures. I can keep shooting, I could just get, click cancel, but let's click yes and we can look at them. And there they are. There's Justin waving. So that's a cool feature that will kind of continuously download either full size or smaller pictures in the background, um, meaning you have them instantly on your smartphone where you could then print them or share them without having to, in other words, it's happening in the background, so everything's automatically sent over. It will burn through a lot of batteries, but um, I've, it, it works pretty well as long as you remember to set it to JPEG. Let's talk about using Bluetooth on this camera. Whereas Wi-Fi is like long distance, high speed, high bandwidth kind of wireless connection, Bluetooth is short range, low power, low bandwidth. So it does some different things like communicates the time and GPS data from your cam your smartphone to your camera, uh, which is just kind of a, a convenience thing. But these are, are useful features. So to do that, the first thing you'll do is you'll go in and turn Bluetooth on. So hit the menu button. I'll go down to the wrench icon here. Go down to Bluetooth. Bluetooth is off. So I will turn that on. And for now, we can terminate the Wi-Fi connection. Okay, so now it's telling me there are no paired devices. So what we're going to do is go into the app here, go to the home. It's still trying to, okay. I'm going to hit Bluetooth here. So now it shows that this camera's ready. I tapped it. Okay, so it wants me to connect to the Wi-Fi network here. So I'll have to go into my settings. There it is. So I'll select the GH5 Wi-Fi network again. So we can see the camera's still waiting. Let's go back here. All right, so now they're connected over Wi-Fi and they're going to use that to communicate about Bluetooth. Pairing completed, yay. Okay, so okay here. So now if I go up here, I can turn Bluetooth on. You can see the camera here is registered. If you click the camera at this point, you have some options about using the uh, Panasonic Lumix cloud service where it can automatically transfer images from your, your camera to your smartphone and then to the cloud. This is gonna burn through a lot of power and might use a lot of data if you're traveling around. Nonetheless, it, it does give you the option to um, automatically back stuff up anywhere in the world. So if somebody were to steal your camera, pictures you took minutes earlier would be safe somewhere. So it is kind of cool. You just have to turn on automatic backup here. And um, you can see you can change the condition where it'll stop if you're running out of batteries and you can change it from original to a smaller version of the image. Um, you delete like location data is turned on by default. So you can turn that off if you want your GPS data to still be stored. They probably have it on because some people would be concerned about privacy. You don't necessarily want the systems administrators at Panasonic knowing exactly where you are as you're taking pictures, but I personally wouldn't care that much. So now that Bluetooth is set up and it's connected, we can go in and um, control exactly what the Bluetooth is capable of. So underneath that Bluetooth menu here on the GH5, you can see we have a lot of options that um, are features of the Bluetooth connection. For example, remote wake up will allow you to turn your camera on from your smartphone. Auto transfer will automatically send pictures over, so we'll give that a shot. So as I went to turn that on, it realized it needs a Wi-Fi connection to the smartphone. So both the camera and the smartphone prompted me to connect to that Wi-Fi network. So on my phone here, I can I just need to connect back to the Wi-Fi network. It would automatically connect if I didn't have my home Wi-Fi within range. But because my phone is seeing my home Wi-Fi, it keeps saying, oh, I'll just connect to that. So that's why I have to keep going back and forth. It's kind of a pain. On Android, you might see that it connects automatically. So what it's done there is set up the uh, automatic transfer of images so that when I take images, it will automatically send them over. The difference between that and what we did in the previous section is that the Bluetooth just simplifies the setup a little bit. It makes it a little bit quicker as far as connect and go goes. And that's a big part of what Bluetooth does for you. Let's go back into the Bluetooth settings here and turn on location logging, which allows your camera to tag GPS data onto each of the photos you take. It's pulling the GPS data from your phone here. So as I turn that on on the camera, the phone prompts me to allow the Panasonic app to access my location data. So I'll tell it to allow that. 
and now my pictures will be automatically GPS tagged. If you use Adobe Lightroom, when you import your pictures, you will be able to go to the map tab, the map panel in Lightroom and see where all your pictures are taken. And if you're traveling around, that's such a cool feature. It also means even if you're just taking pictures of your kids, if you can say, oh, I want to look up those pictures that we took at the park or at the zoo, instead of having to remember the day where you took those pictures to find them, you can just go to the map and zoom right in. I, I love GPS data. In fact, I wish it was built into the camera. Um, we'll also turn on the auto clock set, which is great if you're traveling around between different time zones, because I always forget to change the time on my camera, but now it'll automatically synchronize it up. And uh, that pretty much sums up what you can do with Bluetooth. I'm, I'm glad they have that feature. If some of this seems like a pain to you, if you're struggling getting the Wi-Fi network connected, if you don't feel like manually converting over your raw images to JPEG before sending them over, or if you want to send over video, here's an accessory I really recommend. It's um, a little SD card reader. Now, the one I'm holding is for Apple. I'm going to hold this over here so you can see it. It's got a Thunderbolt port like this, but you can get SD card readers for Android devices or anything else, and it works really, really simply. I'll just take out one of these memory cards here. I will put it into my SD card reader. Wrong way. And then I can just connect it directly into my smartphone or tablet or whatever. And this process is going to be a little bit different than it would be on Android, but on iOS devices like iPhones and iPads, you can see it brings up the import dialog here. And so now I can see all the images that it has on this particular memory card. So I can now go through and just select specific images like that and then click import and just import the selected pictures. And it will copy them over. And now, if they were raw images, you could go into Lightroom and process them. You could pull the videos into iMovie. Even if they're 4K 60p videos, the resolution doesn't matter. It will uh, work really smoothly and, and just perfectly. Uh, when we travel, I'll often make little mini videos based on the videos that I have here, pulling them in through this, and then publishing them directly from my phone. So. That process is what I use more than Wi-Fi. This is just better than Wi-Fi. Now I'll show you how to use the GH5's 6K photo feature, which will take pictures at 30 frames per second. That's super fast. Like even our A9 only does 20 frames a second. It's a little limited. Uh, they're going to be you know JPEG files. Uh, there's not going to be autofocusing while you're you're shooting. But to be able to capture action at 30 frames a second is pretty amazing. So to do that you'll use this shutter dial here and switch it over to 6K. And, uh, well, that pretty much does it. <laughs> There's not much else to it. I wish I, I, let me see, I don't have a fidget spinner or anything. Let's see if I can create some action here. I'm going to focus ahead of time. And then... Okay. So I took a series of pictures there at a super fast rate, and now what I can do is scrub through them. What, what the process for 6K photos is you'll take a whole bunch of photos in a very short amount of time, and then pick the frame that you want, because you probably don't want to be taken, you know, 30 frames a second, that's too many. But it's nice that I can just pick the specific frame that I think is the most interesting. So maybe that's the most interesting frame. And with that selected, I'll touch that and then select Save This Image. So now it's going to do some processing. It kind of extracts it to its own file. And I can go through here and select multiple different images. Like maybe I just think the way it catches the light on this frame is just beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have better action for you. Tap that. And then click Yes. Now you'll notice as you're going through and selecting it, it will prompt you to uh, reduce the rolling shutter right here. Disp, reduce rolling shutter. The rolling shutter will add like a little bit of a slant to any fast moving subjects. Still subjects will not be impacted, but if there's a fast moving subject, it will distort it a little bit. So you can experiment with this by hitting the disp button here and see if it actually improves it. This picture can't be used. I don't know why it's saying that, <laughs> but we'll go ahead and save that picture because that one Really, it's going to go in my scrapbook, and I just want future generations to see that picture. Okay, so that's how you do 6K photo. You know where it's useful is if 
uh, maybe it's a baseball player, is swinging. You really want as many frames as possible if you're going to try to get uh, that bat hitting the ball at that split second, because you can't time that. You really just, there's no substitute for just having as many frames per second as possible. That's the kind of scenario you're going to use it in. You're not going to use it when somebody's running towards you or running away, where it would need to be changing focusing. It's going to be a mostly still subject, but a high action scene. I also want to show you another trick called post focus, which essentially takes pictures at different focal points and then allows you to later choose where you want the focal point to be or even stack those pictures together to get a really high depth of field where everything from the foreground to the background is in focus. And like 6K video, you'll select it by moving the uh, shutter dial here over to this icon. And now you're in post focus mode. So what we can do is Let's see here. Let's set up a little scene with a couple of different cameras. And so there you can see it did a little extra processing. And now that it's captured that, I can click around the different frame. And this one doesn't have a huge amount of background blur, but look at this camera in the background. See how it's blurry there? I can go back there and get the frame where that one's in focus. So it just focused on all different points in the frame, refocused and snapped all those pictures and then just kind of lets me pick which one I want. So now that I picked which one I want, I can click, you can zoom in over here if you want to. See it's zoomed in one to one, so it's just really tight. I'm back here. You can click this icon here to extract a particular image. Notice here I can push FN2 to show focus peaking. So this will show me, see highlighted in blue, it's going to show me which parts of the image were in focus. Here the front of the lens was in focus. There that camera at the back was in focus. Didn't happen to get any images from over here because I didn't see anything in, in two, there wasn't enough contrast. If you want to do the focus stacking, you can touch this icon up here or press the FN1 button. And let's go ahead and do auto merging. This would be more obvious if we were in some beautiful landscape with flowers in the foreground and mountains in the distant uh, background. It would be able to stack those pretty good and make it look pretty good. So what it's prompting me is just it's just confirming that I want to stack those pictures. So now it's going to, because it took pictures with the flowers in the foreground in focus and the mountains in the background in focus, it's going to take those sharp flower pictures and blend them into those pictures where the background is in focus. It's a technique called focus stacking, which is something I describe in chapter 12 of my book, Stunning Digital Photography. Um, I show you how to do it manually in tools like Photoshop, uh, and that will always get you better results than the kind of in-camera focus stacking that happens here. This is okay, but what you'll, the results you'll get, when you go to look at them, you'll see some serious flaws, um, or you might see flaws. It depends on the scene, how much movement it, there is, um, how much the foreground like physically overlaps with the background. These are all factors that will determine the amount of success you'll get with the post focus stacking tools. So what will happen is sometimes uh, those pictures, the pictures that it automatically generates will be usable and good and sometimes it will be unusable. If you manually stack it you always have the opportunity to rescue it. So my suggestion is what I continue to do is to manually change the focusing points myself, focusing in the foreground, focusing in the middle ground, focusing in the background, and then use the techniques that I describe in chapter 13 of Stunning Digital Photography to bring those together into a sharp picture with infinite depth of field. But this is a really quick way to do it. <laughs> so feel free to do that. It can be, if you just want to share some pictures quickly, um, you'll probably get results that are good enough. As I zoom in here, I, you know, the picture's dark, but I don't see any uh, handling artifacts. I think it did a really good job of processing those together, but it is a completely static scene. There's no flowers moving back and forth. That's one of the things that can cause problems. So it's kind of an ideal scenario for that. So that's how you use post focus. Like I said, you might not always want to use it, but I want to show you how. So I want to go over some accessories for the camera that um, in my experience with it have really improved my shooting and talk about some of my favorite lenses, software. The first up is Adobe Lightroom. I constantly use Adobe Lightroom for light editing, photo organizing, and then I will pull images into Adobe Photoshop when I need to do the heavier editing, things like working with layers, blending multiple images together. Um, you can get both of them. Um, 
together by going to sdp.io slash Adobe deal. That's Amazon. And they will just uh, give you like a year of the Adobe Creative Cloud. The way Adobe does pretty much everything now is they want to lease you the software. So they're basically renting you the software. You pay on a monthly basis. But it's not bad. I think it works out to like 10 bucks a month, maybe a little bit less in the U.S. to get both those apps together. And they used to cost, you know, you'd spend 500 bucks on the two of them. So it's not really a bad deal. Some people I know want to purchase it outright. But if you do that, you won't get all the latest updates. And in fact, they cut some major features out of Lightroom for people who don't pay monthly. So I just tell people you just pretty much got to pay monthly. You will get dust on the sensor, especially if you travel around. It's kind of inevitable. Uh, so you'll just have to go in and clean that dust out. Occasionally, you'll end up with spots in the sky and in areas where there aren't much detail. Um, I use this tool at sdp.io slash sensor clear. Notice the K in the name. Um, that takes you to Amazon where you can buy it. And I, I found that's the best way to clean it. I've tested out a bunch of different things. Also check chapter five in stunning digital photography where I have a video showing you exactly how I use sensor clear. Let's talk about lenses. Any micro four thirds lens will work on the GH5. Uh, the two main manufacturers are Panasonic and Olympus. Of course, the GH5 is made by Panasonic and that means that they test it with the own, their own Panasonic lenses. They don't necessarily test it or, or fix problems with Olympus lenses or other manufacturer lenses. Another benefit of using Panasonic lenses is that the hybrid image stabilization can work. So with this Panasonic lens, it'll use the optical image stabilization in the lens and then the sensor stabilization in the camera. Those will combine together and give you really outstanding image stabilization performance. So that's a really good reason to purchase Panasonic lenses over the Olympus lenses if you're working with the GH5. If you're working with lenses that don't have the image stabilization built in, like little primes and stuff, it doesn't make that much of a difference really. I, I, we use lots of Olympus lenses with it and it's been fine. First, my favorite lens is the one that is attached here, the Panasonic 14 to 140. It's just a great walking around lens. It could be a little wider, it could be a little longer, it could be a little sharper. <laughs> but uh, especially for 4K video vlogging, the types of things that we do with it, uh, it's absolutely perfect because it's just so versatile. You can just real quickly zoom in on a faraway subject. So it's just, it's our go-to lens. Even though we have sharper lenses and stuff, it's still the one that gets the most use. You can pick it up from Amazon at sdp.io slash p140. Another lens we use for lower light is the Panasonic 12 to 35 f2.8. So whereas the... A 14 to 140 is an f5.6 lens. This f2.8 lens will gather four times more light, meaning you can get the same video quality or image quality even if the lights are cut by 75% in a particular room. So it's good for low light. But it doesn't have the same range that this 14 to 140 does, so you won't be able to get to faraway subjects the same way. It's also a little wider on the wide end if you're working in tight quarters, so that's what I would pick for events and stuff. Um, so you start to put big glass on these cameras, they become big and bulky, just like bigger DSLRs. However, you always have the option with these mirrorless cameras to slap on a little pancake lens. There's a bunch of different pancake lenses, but my favorite has been the, the Panasonic uh, 20 millimeters F17. It's fast, so it's great in low light, and it's small. So you can see this is now a pretty small kit. You can carry this around with you and put it on your dinner table and it won't take up half the table. And because of the sensor stabiliz stabilization, it'll be stabilized and it's only 250 bucks. So grab one of these from our Amazon link and throw it in your bag and just keep it with you. It's just really convenient. Another lens that I really love is the 45 millimeter F18. It's a great small compact portrait lens. If you want to blur the background, get that kind of effect, it's really great at that. Um, and it's not that expensive. A big step up from that is the 75 millimeter F18. This is an Olympus lens. It is the, it's probably the sharpest lens we own, period, for any of our systems. It's outstandingly sharp. It throws the background so far out of uh, focus. So you get just amazing bouquet with it. It's pretty light. This is actually the lens hoods. That comes off and um, we use it constantly. But we were just always really impressed with the results on that. But you pay for it too. It's like 900 bucks. But it's a great lens. Now... Micro Four Thirds lenses are what we prefer to use. They're natively integrated. They focus the fastest. But if you really want bokeh, if you want like full frame camera results, or if you want really, really low light type of uh, capabilities, you simply cannot beat using 
these two Sigma lenses that I'm about to recommend with a Metabones adapter. So that's what I have on this other camera over here. This is underneath this lens here. This is the Metabones 0.64x XL adapter. And it's specifically designed for using the video modes on the GH5 with um, full frame or APS-C lenses. 0.64 is the crop factor, basically. So you might have heard that Micro Four Thirds cameras have a 2x crop factor, which means that if you attach a 50 millimeter lens to a Micro Four Thirds camera, it will give you an angle of view like a 100 millimeter lens, because 50 times 2 equals 100. Um, but that might not be what you want. <laughs> if you want to back off that crop factor, a 0.64 teleconverter will, will apply against that 2x teleconverter. So the way the math works out is you'll end up with about a 1.3 times crop factor here. So now that 50 millimeter lens that you put on there would end up being like a um, 65 millimeter lens. It would be still a little bit longer than the 50 millimeters, <laughs> but it would be significantly shorter. These Metabones adapters are expensive. It's 650 bucks, but it supports autofocus. It supports electronic control over the aperture if you're using Canon lenses. Pretty much everybody's adapting Canon mount lenses, either Sigma or other third party manufacturers, but Canon mount lenses, EF lenses, to the GH5. The first lens that I suggest for this is the Sigma uh, 18 to 35 f1.8. When you put that Metabones on there, it behaves physically like an 11 to 22 millimeter f1.1 zoom lens. So that's in like micro four thirds terms. But a zoom lens at f1.1 is amazing. And you can shoot with this GH5 in near darkness, the darkest bar restaurant you can imagine, and you'll get nice, clean video. You also get that like full frame look for background blur. So even at a wide angle, you can focus on a nearby subject and cast the background noticeably out of focus. It's, it's totally pro looking. It is cinematic looking. Uh, this particular combination, the Metabones and then the 18 to 35 also pr pr produces incredible flare <laughs> for better or worse. You will be like JJ Abrams if the sun or any light source is nearby because it just flares like crazy. Nonetheless, I've shot a lot with this combination and I really like the results. In full frame terms, the combination of this Metabones and that 18 to 35 uh, turns it into uh, this, an equivalent of 22 to 44 millimeters f2.2. So it doesn't quite have the range of a 24 to 70 f2.8 that you might use on a full frame camera, but it's actually faster. It's actually gathering more light. So it'll actually produce better results in low light and give you a little bit more background blur in that limited range. Another lens I, I really like is this monster here, the Sigma 50 to 100 f1.8. And so again, it's an f1.8 zoom, but then you put on this Metabones adapter and it becomes an f1.1 zoom. Even in 35 millimeter full frame terms, it turns into a 64 to 128 millimeter f2.2 zoom, which it, again, that's incredibly fast. It means it's going to work incredibly well in low light. Uh, one caveat with both these lenses and the Metabones adapters that I want to warn you about is if you're using the full width, if you're not using the digital teleconverter, and you're using the um, sensor stabilization, you will sometimes get weird vignetting. If you're walking around, the sensor will be moving and it might jut into parts of the frame that don't have any light. <laughs> so you might then have to go back in post and crop it down a little bit to cut out that vignetting. It will happen sometimes um, at the wider angles of these two lenses. So if you have that 18 to 35 and you're shooting at the widest side of it, you might see a little bit of that jutting around if you're also moving. But during normal shooting, tripod shooting, you wouldn't see any of that. You also wouldn't see it if you just zoomed into like 20 millimeters or so. If you want to eliminate any possibility of, use, of vignetting, instead of getting the 0.64x uh, speed booster, get the 0.71 from Metabones. I'm going to recommend our two favorite, our three favorite tripods, two favorite tripods. Our favorite travel tripod is the Be Free Live. It has a pan tilt head. It's fairly small. It has a leveling head too. So, you know, if you're on unlevel ground a little bit, you know how such a pain it can be to get everything leveled. It just makes it really easy to level it. It's only 212 bucks, but we have great results with it. Um, check it out at Amazon at sdp.io slash BFL. If you want a more serious 
video tripod and you don't need that sort of portability. This is the combination that we use. It's heavier duty, um, but the panning and tilting is much smoother. Um, check it out at sdp.io slash levelhead on Amazon. A couple of mic suggestions. The mic I'm using now is the Sennheiser EW100 G3. People always ask what mic you are using. It sounds good. The kit can be kind of expensive, 620 bucks, but you can pick it up at sdp.io slash G3. I know people go through, if you're currently using a shotgun mic like this Rode, the results are going to be so much better. It's, of course, you have to mic the person, but it, it just gives you better sound than a shotgun mic. We still use a shotgun mic on a regular basis because it's convenient, though. Um, if you need to mic two people, you can get two sets of those G3s and combine them with one of these breakout cables or any, you want to combine any two mics. These breakout cables that I'm suggesting take one mic and put on the left channel of the audio and the second mic and put on the right channel of the audio. When you go and import your video files, you'll just need to split those apart as two separate mono channels. We've used that for years. It works really good. That $10 breakout cable is such a lifesaver. Um, Recently, for our field work, we still use the Sennheisers in the studio here, but for our field work, we've switched to using Sony lavalier mics uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that we have fewer interference problems. I don't know if the radio frequencies are just a little more powerful or whatever, but as we travel around to different places, we find random interference. So we like them be better for that purpose. Um, another benefit, you can see one set of them is 530 bucks at sdp.io slash Sony Lav, Sony Lav at Amazon. The uh, other benefit to that system is they have a dual receiver available. So for 800 bucks, it's expensive, you can get one of these receivers that will allow two wireless lav mics to come into a single receiver. And that has saved us a lot of trouble because we're constantly miking both me and Chelsea and we used to always have two separate Sennheiser receivers on the camera on like the set of Andlers and then the breakout cable. It's so nice that the Sony Lav just reduces that to one device. It's less to troubleshoot. It's a, one fewer pair of batteries that you have to worry about carrying around. And just that's our suggestion if you need to mic multiple people. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope you appreciate that making this video is an effort on our part. Like my voice is completely blown out. We had to film it over two separate days, which is why if you noticed any discontinuity, <laughs> that's why. Uh, one way you can show our support is by subscribing to get more free videos. You can give us a comment, say, it, say your own suggestions for using the GH5, suggest products that you think would help, or just say thanks. Um, you can give us a like to help us out. Share it with your friends. Send them to stp.io slash tutorial for other camera tutorials. And you can buy our books that help support all this and make it all possible. Stunning Digital Photography teaches you not just photography, but the basics of composition, light, mood, portrait, uh, posing portraits, storytelling, the things that will really escalate your images and video from snapshots to really serious work. For stills work, you'll definitely want to be using Lightroom and Photoshop. That's just what all the pros use. And to get the most out of them, you'll need some education. So our books include uh, more than 10 hours of video training in each of those that will, so you can read or you can watch the videos or you can do both, whatever's more convenient for you. And if you just have gear questions, if you just want to know which lens to get or what the EF, difference between EFS and EF lenses is, uh, I have this massive gear Bible, the photography buying guide that answers all those questions for you and can save you thousands of dollars. The ebook versions of these things are only 10 bucks. You can pick them up at our store. We ship worldwide at stp.io slash store, or just go to Amazon and search for Tony Northrop or Stunning Digital Photography and look at the reviews there because the reviews are kind of brave. STP has over 2,000 reviews with a five-star average rating. We're really proud of that. People are really happy with the book. So I hope you enjoy it too. Um, again, follow up with any comments down below and thanks. Bye.